You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another awesome edition of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul. And my name is Rob, and yeah, certainly hoping that you think it's awesome. We certainly think it's awesome to be sitting here hanging with you, and we definitely appreciate that you are spending a few minutes of your day with us. And uh, for those of you that have taken some time to send in your question to askdroneeu.com, we are very appreciative. For those of you that have become members, we are very appreciative. For those of you who have left reviews, even those that we aren't very excited to hear about, we still like to learn from you and know how we can do better. So we appreciate you too. So thank you guys for being you and uh, let's hop in. Yeah, we've got a great question today um, regarding very large data sets, which actually kind of coincides with an article uh, that I wrote this week about um, the best mapping drones for small areas and for large areas as we had some students Rob, who are still buying the wrong drones because everyone thinks it's more convenient to get that Phantom 4 Pro Plus, mm. but you can't download any software on that little screen, so uh, it's actually useless. Um, I feel like that is a nice word to use. Um, and so that for mapping, yeah, for mapping. And that said, uh, also talked about you know the Wingtra One and how powerful that is uh, for for these larger sites. And uh, you know, I think that this is an interesting question that we have here today, just kind of regarding deliverables, because um, a lot of people run into problems when they get in these larger sites, and they and they realize the limitations of their computing power. And so, uh, I think this is going to be a good one. And I just want to say, if any of you are really looking to, you know, find a more sequential chronological training on drone mapping. You want that comprehensive drone mapping training. You know, we have been talking for a while about the props program and how it's really built for teams, but it can also work and is built for singular pilots as well. And if you thrive in a more structured environment and you want that more sequential training, more frequent quizzes, tests, you like the scenario based, uh, you know, certificates and whatnot, I really recommend you check out uh, props.thedroneu.com or propsflightschool.com. Check it out. I think you're really going to like it. Also, uh, in the hopes that uh, we don't get another shutdown, we are planning, and in Texas, obviously, uh, we are planning an experience <laughs> training in Texas, which is going to be seven days of training. And uh, we're hoping it all goes through uh, because it's going to be a real world uh, mission for pilots. And it's going to cover creative and technical aspects. Think of it really like a mini fly-in. And then we're ending it with a uh, Kara's brand new class about helping drone pilots scale all of their business systems right from the start, just to make it a whole lot easier uh, to run your business over time. This is not, you know, a um, whimsical, here's some, you know, uh, templated logos and, and marketing material. This is like actually autonomy for your company at every given level to really allow for guys like myself that sometimes struggle with maintaining the hustle over time. It just makes it so much easier. So the experience training will be open to eight people only and the sales class will be open to 20 people only. Kara will be teaching that. It's really about business systems, not so much sales, but it does include autonomous upsells, which is really nice. Um, but that said, I'm hoping that we get to do that. Uh, we are going to require the prerequisite of our mapping class uh, to attend that training, at least the experience part of the training. And I, I brought all this up because uh, props is a great way to go through that. Otherwise, you can become a member and check out the comprehensive mapping class and kind of go at your own pace. But that was actually a nice little segue into our sponsor for this question, which is props.thedroneu.com or check out propsflightschool.com. Hey guys, this is Gabe from Maryland. Had a quick question regarding deliverables for linear mapping projects. I just got asked to map 30 miles of transmission right-of-ways and 
accuracy is not very important, so GCPs are not required. And with it being 30 miles, I'm going to have to break this up into you know several sections to comply with Part uh, 107 rules and regulations and you know, stay compliant with that. So my question is, what would your deliverables be if you were me? Um, and you, you know, flew these 30 miles and had to obviously break them up into sections or through, or flew, you know, 50 miles and had to break them up into numerous sections and GCPs were required, or even if they, you know, uh, were not required, would you provide them an overall large orthomosaic and digital service model? And if so, how would you do that? And, uh, how would you also provide, you know, the other deliverables that you may offer. Uh, I'm curious to know what you guys think because I keep kind of, uh, running into an issue of getting, you know, um, into QGIS and merging these tips in there. However, the tips are too large to do so. So the, the merge fails, you know, looking forward to any solutions that you guys, uh, might know about. And, uh, I look forward to hearing your response. Thank you so much. I appreciate all you guys do and uh, have a great day. Thanks, Gabe. Um, appreciate the uh, detailed question. And sounds like you got a lot going on there. Sounds like you're also in the middle of a pretty steep learning curve, which I feel you, but you'll get there. And I think Paul might have some ideas for you, would be my guess. Well, I mean, I think, you know, Rob, uh, oftentimes we kind of follow the client's lead. Uh, in regards to deliverables, as True. typically they they have a specific problem that they want to solve. Albeit, you and I both know that is not always the case, as oftentimes uh, we have seen even public utilities purchasing aircraft without having any idea how to use them or who will fly them or what to get out of them. So mm -hmm. while uh, it's easy to sit here on a high horse and be like, well, he should know what deliverables, I don't think we, I don't think it's so easy to, uh, to assume. And in an effort to not be an asshole, Rob, I'm not going to assume I'm going to ask some questions. So, in an effort to not. <laughs> that's a good effort. Oh, I think that's you. a solid effort to thank pursue. You. I, uh, maybe Peter will try it as well. I don't know. I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. New Yorkers are a whole different animal. Sorry, guys. Love you. Uh, sorry, not sorry, Peter. Uh, anyway, um, that, that said, uh, deliverables. First off, um, without getting into specific deliverables as far as an ortho, which is probably what they're looking for at the end of the day, and ignoring uh, the digital surface model. But at least he said DSM. I mean, oftentimes a lot of people, uh, you know, say that they are going to get a DEM, an elevation model, and not a surface model. And there is a difference between those. So we got to give them props there. Get it? Props? Props.thedroneu.com. Um, but uh, anyway, long story short is... Uh, Shameless. Uh, oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I got no shame. Um, but that brings us to a good point, which is he's having difficulty merging those TIFFs together. And he, uh, he foresees issues in being able to do that. So I want to bring up a couple of potential solutions um, under, you know, he mentioned that it's 30 miles. If we kind of take the vague definition of visual line of sight from the FAA, this sounds like it's going to be about 60 sections of flights. And in an effort to get that entire 30 mile segment of data to auto um, merge together, um, you're going to have to have like 10 to 20% overlap from one mission set to the next mission set. So, I mean, like imagine the computer that you, you know, you mapped, a, say, let's say halfway, mm -hmm. you would want to start, you know, say 10, 20% in and then complete the rest uh, of that section. Mm -hmm. When you do that, then you can actually merge all the photos together in one project in Pix4D Mapper. But e so... A couple butts here. One, 30 miles is a lot. Is it possible in Mapper? Yes. I've seen much larger than that in Mapper. But he might want to look at Pix40 Matic. Matic is made for those larger data sets. Hmm. Um, that said as well, you know, we don't know what kind of computer he has, Rob, but let's assume that he is not like most people who completely overestimate the power of their computer uh, and then come to mapping class and have a harsh reality when they get here. Uh, <laughs> but um, that said, let's imagine he's got a super powerful computer. Um, I honestly, if georeferencing is not imperative, 
then what I would do is I would use Pix40 React. And the reason that I would do that is twofold. Uh, number one, you're going to get the ortho the fastest way possible. Number two, with Pix40 React, you only fly a uh, single grid mission. So overall, the time for acquisition is going to be cut relatively in half, which is going to be very valuable for him. Um, in addition to that, he's going to have the overall output much faster than Matic or Matic. Mapper. Let's give him another option. Uh, the other option is, is that if, uh, again, let's imagine that he's got a computer fast enough to run all the data, or maybe he doesn't. Let's go with he doesn't. He can import all of those photos into Pix40 Mapper on his desktop. Now, key point, you'll have to have all those photos saved in a folder on your desktop, which this is something that still really irks me about Pix4 D using the cloud system, you always got to have all that crap on your desktop and it slows your computer down astronomically. It's like a double negative, you know, it's mm. like burning the wick at both ends here. Um, so what he could do is he could set up his project. He could set up step one. He could set up the processing options for step two. If it's non-geo reference, obviously he can just run step one and two together. Uh, but then what I would do is I would push it to the cloud and I would let the cloud servers run it if his computer is not fast enough. Hmm. In order to do that, you will have to have all the photos on your desktop to do it. So just recapping, option one, Pix40 React, single grid nader. Let's say he needs more 3D data to really understand where those tree lines are. Well, then, you know, maybe he wants to do a double grid, run Pix40 Mapper. Uh, he can run it in the cloud if he doesn't have a fast computer. Option three is Pix40 Matic, which is made for those larger data sets. But I think, you know, as I analyze the options that we've get, given him on the show, it sounds like a single grid Nader camera orientation utilizing Pix40 React might be the best overall solution as it will reduce his processing time. In addition, it will reduce the acquisition time as the acquisition strategy will be a simple single grid rather than a double grid. <sighs> Wow. Well done. Because 30 <laughs> miles, I mean, it's going to take some time. I mean, 30 miles, that particular job, if, if he's working as an employee for the, the client, I think it would be worth getting that, you know, they call them beyond visual line of sight waivers. But when you read through the fine print, you realize they're more like extended visual line of sight. And so, I mean, that might be in his best interest, frankly, to, to really look up applying for one of those. Particularly if he's going to be doing more of these. Yes. And we do have a template for that. We have not released it publicly, but now we have one. Um, and if you're interested in, in that, we would be happy to help you uh, acquire that waiver. That said, uh, overall, I mean, I think it's a very interesting mission. And I would say that, you know, oftentimes even us experienced mappers can run into missions that the problem that's trying to be solved isn't quite clear um, as communicated from the client, which can sometimes, you know, uh, create a haze when determining what deliverables might really be adequate. And on that point, it's a, a, because he did not allude, because he's asking you, us, whatever, what deliverables he mm -hmm. should be giving, right? Yeah. Tells me he may want to go back to the client and have a couple conversations and make sure it's understood what they're looking for. A hundred percent agreed. Because you don't want to do a whole bunch of work because it's going to be a fair amount of work. Even if you use something like React, mm -hmm. it's going to be a lot of work, worked, work. And to find out that maybe a section they did want geo-referenced or who knows? I mean, you got to kind of talk them through it. A hundred percent. And, you know, if he's also having issues in QGIS or ArcGIS, I can't remember which one he said he was using, um, I would then try to merge all the data in the processing, not in the post-processing. In addition, if you had processed those projects under different parameters or processing templates, you could run into stitching errors through Arc and Q, which would be why it's not working. So mm. I could see a couple of potential issues coming up, frankly. Sure, so, that makes sense. Yeah. It's going to have to be very uniform form mm -hmm. to work that way, I yeah, would imagine. Yeah, totally. Cool. But uh, I think that answers the question. I, I do want to remind everyone, you know, we have an extensive guide on drone mapping. If you go to thedroneu.com forward slash what dash is dash drone dash mapping dash software forward slash, um, you can check out a guide there. Uh, we do have a virtual mapping class coming up. Uh, it's not on the site yet, but we actually have in-person mapping classes as well, and we're going to have them anyway no matter what. Uh, so they are going to be here at headquarters. And you know, Rob, this brings up something that really excites me, which is thanks to you. What? Really? And your familia. We have a nice 
we have a really nice, cool setup for mapping classes now out mm. uh, in the Bosque. And I mean, we did a mapping class out there a couple weeks ago, and it was an absolute blast. It was so much fun. Perfect subject for 3D and 2D assets. I mean, uh, I'm just, I'm just, yeah, I, lo- I had a lot of fun. I'm so glad to hear that. I'm glad it worked out. It is perfect. There's nobody out there. It's peaceful. Um, airspace is completely clear. I mean, it just checks all the boxes. It really does. It's, it's a really beautiful house and a big house, and it's it's nice. It is, and I mean, it's it's just the perfect size yeah. to get mapping exercises in. I'm not going to give the dirty details, but I mean, um, I'm going to post that 3D model here shortly. In fact, reminds me, I, uh, I want to go run another project uh, combo, um, and I think that that particular exercise will be very good for um, our new mapping class. Classes. In addition, you know, I've been telling you that I want to do a complex 3D modeling class and kind of, you know, showcase other softwares other than PICS. And it's time to write the curriculum and get it done. So anyway, I'm excited for that. Fantastic. Um, for all of you out there, uh, I really do appreciate your support. Uh, for those of you who are DroneU members, greatly appreciate it. Um, and uh, for all of those of you who are thinking about, you know, is there a way I can maybe level up my knowledge in one particular way or another, you might want to consider becoming a member of DroneU. I promise it's worth it. That said, it's going to do it for us today. My name is Paul. My name's Rob. This is Ask DroneU. DroneU.